Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. So excited to be with you today. I am Bree Noble, and I am here with my friend, Chris Bradley. Chris is a returner to the podcast, and it's because I love everything that she does. We've been friends for several years. Uh, I remember, I think we met super long time ago when I played her music on Women of Substance, and now she's doing so many awesome things in the music industry to help other musicians. She's helped hundreds of my students. So I'm excited to talk about, um, you know, something new and and kind of a new direction that she's going to help musicians make money in even more cool and interesting ways that they haven't even thought about. So that's what this show is all about. So we'll get into that in a minute. Um, Chris, do you want to give them just a, just a quick synopsis of your journey a little bit in case they don't know anything about you? Sure. So I am a singer, songwriter, producer, and um, I started as a singer, songwriter actually years ago. And I just, you know, I found that I was doing things like trying to pitch my music for opportunities, whether it be to get another artist to cut my song or to get my music into film and TV. It was like, wow, I need demos for this, which kind of forced me out of necessity at the time to learn how to produce because I could not afford to hire a producer every time I wrote a new song. Um, And so um, I started learning how to produce out of necessity necessity. And it really opened up all these different doors for me that were so that I had never even imagined. So I went from doing I started doing songwriter demos for other people to producing albums um, for myself and for other artists. All of a sudden, I was able to get my music into film and TV. I started doing custom songwriting. Um, I've started a podcast and just so many other doors open for me once I learned how to produce. And then I, of course, fell in love with producing after doing it for a couple of years. And here I am today. (laughs) <laughs> oh, wow. I can't believe you're able to do that so quickly because it's been such a such a twisty, turny, turny journey, I'm sure, as as mine was as well. Um, so you've you started helping musicians to learn how to produce themselves and especially singer songwriters. Right. Because we've got all these great song ideas. And I love what you say about like you don't want them, you know, sitting on your phone or sitting in this like vault in your computer and not getting heard just because you can't afford to pay somebody to help you to produce it. Or, you know, you, you don't know how to do it on your own. You don't know what software to use all of that stuff. What have you found with um, your students since you started helping people with this, that is kind of, they're like, that really opens up new opportunities for them. Like where are they when they start? And then where are they after you kind of teach them these skills? Like, do they start getting all these amazing aha moments? Oh my gosh, I could do this. I could do that with this. Or are they just still focused on producing their own songs? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I call it the hard drive graveyard, right? We have all these (laughs) songs that that we write and it's like, whether we're writing them for ourselves and we want to release them one day or whether we're pitching them for opportunities to try and monetize our music, it's like they end up just getting like piling up on our hard drive graveyard. And let's say we pitched it for an opportunity and it didn't make it, right? And they didn't didn't get selected. Well, now we just kind of move on to the next thing. And we don't actually realize that we're accumulating this kind of like gold that if we would just had the opportunities and the resources to pitch it for other things that we could be placing our music. And so that's what I'm finding with the students is like they came in to learn how to produce their music. But now, you know, I've got a couple of students that are doing voiceovers. Um, I got a couple of students that are editing podcasts. Um, I've got students that are doing custom songwriting. They've actually started a business custom songwriting songs for for other people as gifts and for celebrations and you know for for brands you know um ever since they learned how to produce and it doesn't mean that they have to be like this over the top like you know super experienced producer to be able to do some of these jobs you know you can do anything from session work where someone's hiring you to just sing a vocal on a song or a demo vocal to arranging for somebody to putting together a simple demo you know 
Yeah. And I, and I, as you were talking about that, I was thinking back to my experience and I certainly was not a production guru in any way, but I did all of those things. And I, I think about it now and I'm like, how did I, how did I sell myself as a person that could do those things? How did I end up doing those things for people when I didn't have any kind of like certifications? I didn't have, I hadn't even taken courses truthfully. Cause back then you didn't, you didn't do this stuff and no one was teaching this stuff and I'd figured it out all on my own, but somehow I was able to say to like, yeah, I can arrange your song or yeah, I'd love to record that vocal or Hey, I'll mix all of your songs. I mean, I've mixed an entire CD for multiple people. <laughs> did I really know what I was doing? I don't know. Like I thought, I thought I produced a pretty decent sound, but you know, how do people get the confidence to put themselves out there to say like, I'm offering this as a service. Well, first off, like, like you just said, there was that little bit of imposter syndrome of like, am I, should I be charging for this? Like, do I know what I'm doing? It's like, okay. So when, when people connect with you and here's, here's the competitive advantage you have. If you, first of all, have a home studio, but also if you just handle yourself like a professional, I am a big fan of what they call talent stacking, right? Um, mm. A lot of people, they, they are aspiring to be experts, right? They're like, oh, I just need to be the best at what I do. And then success will follow. And it actually, I don't feel that that's how it works. I feel like through talent stacking, you actually get a competitive advantage above other people because it's like, now you know how to mix, right? Now you know how to sing, but also you know how to run a business. You know how to correspond with clients and, and how to file share and how to guide somebody through the process professionally right? So what's more valuable? The person who's the best mix engineer in the world, but has no systems, doesn't know how to run a business. Isn't, you're not able to find them because they don't know how to market themselves or the person who's a pretty good mixer, but they've done the, the legwork to understand how to build an infrastructure that can facilitate a business relationship with a client. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, it's so <laughs> true. Because, I mean, I, I, I do think that that's like 80% of it, right? Just having, making people feel like you can actually deliver what yeah. you're saying you can deliver and following through with that. Because for me, I just ended up getting a bunch of referrals, right? I didn't go put exactly. myself out there and say, Hey, I'm, I do mixes or, Hey, I do arrangements or anything. It was just songwriters or other people that I work with telling other people about what I did. Yeah. And yeah. that's, yeah, that's, it's really only going to be built up by having that set of systems where you're proving to them, like I'm a professional and I'm able to, to really deliver on what I say I'm able to deliver on. So how do they go about setting up kind of, what kind of systems do they need to be able to do this as an income generation option? Yeah. Well, the first things first, they have to have a home studio set up. Okay. We're talking about running a business out of our studio where we can provide services that go anywhere from, like I said, podcasts, custom songs, session work, producing songs, producing demos, producing for film and TV, right? So we've got to have the, the home base set up. So you absolutely have to be able to record and produce yourself. And then the next thing is you need to have in line is you need to, you know, think about like, what is the name of, of my company and be able to set that up so that you can function as a production company. You can also decide to use your artist name if that works for you. But I think you'll find as you start diversifying what you're doing, that it's best to kind of come up with a company name that becomes an umbrella that goes over you as the artist, but can also kind of encompass all the other random side odd jobs. You know, like you wouldn't say, I'm Brie Noble, the podcast editor. You'd be like, no, I'm Brie Noble, the artist, but like my production company is called you know, Brie Noble Productions, and we also do podcast editing, right? So you just need to be, it's these little things just like that. Setting up your business is actually not as hard as a lot of people think. I functioned as a sole proprietor for years and years before I actually moved to being an LLC. Me so too. It, I only that, became an LLC last year. Me, me too, actually, maybe, yeah, last year. So it's like a lot of people, this, once again, it gets into this procrastination where they're like, well, I don't know, what do I got to do? Is it a DBA? Is it an LLC? It's like, no, so, you know, starting the company is not actually, it's not the paperwork that you're filling out that starts the company. It's the systems that you're putting in place. So just a couple examples of systems that I have is, you know, if I have tasks that are things that I do on repeat, I automate them, right? 
Um, I also, I have like um, a whole file system of like where to keep my new clients. I've got project management boards of the process that I take a client through from beginning to end a step-by-step -step system. So when I onboard a new client, I'm not like, oh, okay, what do I do next? It's like, no, there's a welcome email. I've got to collect some assets from them. They need to get an invoice from me. They need to pay a deposit. That's external, right? And then internally, what do I do once all those things are in place? Well, okay, I'm going to work with this work tape. I'm going to do the arrangement. So I've got all these checklists that I keep as well on my end. So once again, it just comes back to having systems. Another thing that people choke up on is they go, oh gosh, well, I don't know how to correspond with clients. No problem. Let's get a set of email templates together that are just locked and loaded, ready to go. They're always going to be at about 80%. You want to customize that final 20%. You know, like for example, if someone wants to hire you for a vocal, you could have an email template ready to go, right? In your Gmail templates that says like, hey, thanks so much for re uh, reaching out. I'd love to sing on your track. Um, you know, my rate is XYZ. And um, I'd love to hear some song references that you had in mind for the style you'd like to go with this track. That is a copy pasteable template. Then you just mm -hmm. go and fill it in. What is the rate? Because it might change depending on the project and what are the references you're asking and so on and so forth. So it's these little things that kind of don't sound super sexy because it's not the gigging to make the music part, right? But it's these little things that you put in place and it kind of creates this system that allows you to function. I always say it's like, you know, we're used to working for other people and having a boss breathing down our neck. You need to become the boss that breathes down your own neck and says, hey, this needs to be done. We need to have a system for this. Mm, I love all of that because I think, I mean, I see so many service providers where thing, everything falls through the cracks. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had people come to me like several months later and be like, oh, I forgot to charge you for this. Can you send me the money? I'm like, oh my gosh, like, yeah. how are you still working? So yeah. yeah. And, and also, you know, you want to eliminate that back and forth, right. And having those systems, mm -hmm. like having an intake form and invoices all automated and everything, you don't want to feel like you're constantly in your inbox going back and forth. You could spend hours, oh, right. Yeah. Going back and forth with clients about, you know, what do I need next and all of that stuff. Absolutely. And, and just speaking of spending hours, you know, one of the things that, you know, I'm really trying to hammer in and in, in my, my training with people is that, you know, you need to start valuing your time as, as the entrepreneur that you are, because if you want to make money with your music, you're an entrepreneur, whether you start a production company or not, right? Like you are in a business of service. So, I mean, a really good thing to do is to get really intentional. A lot of artists that they don't do that. They just go, I want to make it. I want to get my music into film and TV. And I don't know if behind that, you know, the details they're leaving out, they think there's millions of dollars for the first placement they get, but it don't work like that, right? It's an accumulation of like usually multiple streams of income that lead to this success. So I'm really a big fan of getting super intentional. So back to the time thing, if you want to, let's say you want to make a hundred thousand dollars a year as an artist, right? Well, you need to break down. Okay. If I'm willing to work 40 hours a week, right? And there's 50, let's say 50 weeks in it. Let's say you could take two weeks off a year, right? And you do the math and you do the division. That means you need to, you need to make $50 an hour, right? To make a hundred thousand dollars a year, working 40 hours a week, taking two weeks off. So what tasks are you doing in your business that aren't worth $50 an hour that you could outsource? Would it be making graphics, right? Mm -hmm. Would it be posting on social media? Would it even be at a certain point mixing on a project that you fully produced? Let's say you're getting paid a thousand dollars to produce a song. How long does it take you to mix it? Are you a mixing professional? Is that your zone of genius? No, because I know a guy who's 150 bucks that it is. And if you've got multiple projects in your pipeline, does it make sense to start outsourcing? You know, That's yeah, how we value our time. You know, the most successful people, they value their time over money, right? I agree. I agree. And, and, and as you said, like certain things only you can do, like if your magic is the production part. Yeah. But you don't love the mixing or even if you notice in yourself, like you're good at mixing, but you tend to spend like way more time mixing than you should because you like to tinker and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, totally. You may just be like, no, like I need to take this off of my plate and give it to someone who I know is going to get it done for a certain dollar amount, like you said, instead of my hours ballooning into this crazy dollar amount, because I could be spending those hours doing something else. hundred percent. And a good example of that, that I like to give is I've been playing guitar for over 20 years and I can play guitar on my tracks, but I, but I don't because I don't live, eat, breathe, sleep. Guitar. I'm not playing every day. You know, I'm, I'm running two different businesses. I'm doing a lot of things I'm producing, right? It is no longer the thing where I'm like, Ooh, if I don't do that, that's going to be the thing that makes or breaks. No, not only that, 
it's probably going to be better if I get the guy who's like, guitar is my jam. That's what I do, you know? And so, I mean, I think also we just need to be able to release ego because I think a lot of musicians think like, Ooh, you know, if I mix and master and write and produce and sing on this, that that's what gives it value because we're uh, mistakenly equating the amount of hard work put in to equal the amount of value that something has. And that's like saying, if I go to dig a pool with a shovel, it's more valuable than using a bulldozer because I worked harder. Mm. Mm. <laughs> it's not true. The only thing that is, that is, that is, is the results is that equals the success, right? Yeah, that's a good analogy. And, and <laughs> if people really quote, you know, if they dig into it, right. And see how you built that pool and they realized, oh my gosh, you leveraged your time by using this other piece of equipment. You know, it's, you're definitely looking like a smarter business person. I, it always, it always to me looks better when someone's working smarter rather than harder. Exactly. exactly. But we, we, some of us, at least I know I kind of grew up with that feeling like the harder you, you know, the more money you want, you have to work harder for it. Right. Right. That's something that's been conditioned into us. And I think as musicians too, like we're service providers mm -hmm. that, that has ha you know, with gigs, right. In, in order to make money, we have to go out there and do the thing. Um, or we have to, you know, teach lessons or whatever. We haven't learned how to leverage our time. For example, if you're someone that teaches lessons, you could start a company that brought in other people to teach the lessons for you. And your job could be to get the students because that's what you're really good at or whatever. That doesn't devalue you mm -hmm. just because, you know, other people might be doing some of your teaching. And same thing with like what you said, if, if you outsource some of the process, that doesn't mean that you're not a full service shop and you can't say that. Absolutely. And that's not even something that frankly, that gets discussed with the client. You know, when I, here's a, here's a mistake I used to make, I'll, I'll drop this right now. When clients, <laughs> would, when clients would come to me at first, when I started getting paying production clients, I'd go, I was insecure about my ability to mix. So I would just say, okay, but I'm just a producer. So I think you should get this mix. And, and they would be okay with that. But then, then they also be like, well, where do I go to get it mixed? And mm -hmm. then where do I go to get it mastered? And I found that by just stepping up to the plate, and expanding on my budget a little bit and saying, okay, I'm the one-stop shop. You're trusting me as the producer. I'm in charge of this product. So I will make sure that it gets mixed and I will make sure that it gets mastered. I will make sure that, what oh, do you need alt mixes for your sync pitches? I'll get you those too. It's like, how can I create an experience for the client where they're like, oh my God, I feel so taken care of. I feel so listened to and my needs are being met. Because they're not going, but did you actually program that? You know, like, did you play that part or did you mix it? No, they're just like, that's not the job of a producer is the visionary. They are in charge of seeing a product into its, uh, a song into its fruition, not necessarily doing all the little tasks in between. Right. Yes. That, absolutely. That's what I mean by produce like a boss, you know, <laughs> I love that. And, and yeah, and you are the boss, right. And as a boss, you could delegate. Heck yeah. Heck makes yeah. total sense to me, but you, I mean, you are the, you're the buck stops with you though, right? You are taking the responsibility of this is a good product that I'm going to deliver to you. Absolutely. Doesn't mean you have to do every single stitch of it. No. And just, you know, to touch on that for a second, when you're first getting started and I, and I, and I talk about this, um, in some of my training, you know, let's say someone hires you to do a vocal. And I used to do, I used to have like 10 vocal projects in a, in my project management work board at a time. So let's say you're doing, you're working on 10 different vocal tracks and let's say your rate is $150, right? For a vocal. If you can find someone to tune for you for 50 bucks at first, it's like, Whoa, that's like a third of my rate. It feels heavy. But if you have 10 tracks and you're constantly getting new clients, or heck, if you're getting that many, maybe you up your rate, you know, but the fact mm -hmm. is, is that you can actually outsource that vocal tuning if you can get someone to do it for 50 or 75 and take that off your plate. Because yes, as a vocal session singer, you should be delivering on I'm sorry, tuned files back to your client, you know, and usually when the DJs or the producers hire, that's a lot of the work I get is for that, they, that they want the finished product, right? They're not looking to also edit and tune, but if you have one client on your board or two, you're probably not going to find somebody who's really good at tuning for less than 50 or 75 bucks. You're probably going to want to go ahead and just do that yourself. Learn it. You know, it's not saying um, don't learn how to do anything and delegate it. It's learn how to do it. And then you're in a position to, to delegate it better when you're ready and when it's appropriate, but it's not because you don't know how to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I would even say when you're first getting started, like it might not make sense because you might not be able to charge a thousand dollars for, you know, if someone's willing to pay you $300 for a demo, 
do the demo, get through the mixing and put in that extra work because the value you're getting out of it is you're getting paid to grow and learn. And you know, you're working on a demo. It's okay. Yeah. Like, you know, and yeah. knowing the difference between that and someone who goes, Hey, I'm going to release this and this is going to go to iTunes and Spotify. Okay. We need a bigger budget. We need to get a mixing engineer in here and just being able to kind of learn that process as you go. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And on that, you know, about being an entrepreneur, I think part of being an entrepreneur is thinking of new ways that you can sell to the same customer or new things that you can offer. Mm -hmm. What do you teach along those lines? Cause I heard you mention like, Oh, do you want alt mixes? Do you want, you know, what kind of things can we kind of throw in? That's like, maybe your customer hasn't even thought of that are kind of add-ons that you could even bring up the price per customer. Absolutely. So alt mixes has, has been one, one thing for me that I noticed nobody else was offering. And I noticed that a lot of my clients are pitching for film and TV. So I just built it into my price. You know, a lot of people ask me about discounting and I'm like, I stay away from that. I always say, if you want to stand out in the market, if you play the discount game, you're just going to keep lowering your price to compete with people because that's all you got. Mm -hmm. But yep. if you play the value game, all you got to do is come in and provide more value. So um, for me, alt mixes was definitely a big one. Uh, I also think that you can increase the value by like, let's say you've got a brand new artist. They don't know anything about the next steps. They're just so excited to get their song produced, but they don't know anything about marketing or promotion or distribution. Could you facilitate that pathway for them? Could you say, you know what, I will also get this, you know, actually help you through the distribution process, almost like an administrator, right? Oh, that's a great idea. Cause so many people come to me, they're like, I don't know what distributor to use. I don't know how to yeah. set up my album for, you know, and it's yeah. like overwhelming to them. And if that's like secondhand to you, you could totally help with that. Right. And for us, it's like, oh, that's easy. We just log into C baby or TuneCore and we upload. Right. But for them, they're like distribution, big, scary word. I'm an artist. I don't really know that yet. And rather than going, you know, you can go learn that. It's like, well, they're ready to release. Like a lot of people are willing to pay for done for you services. Right. So could you help them create the album artwork? Are you one of those unicorns that also has graphic design skills or could you help them find? Could you facilitate that relationship? Once again, it's like, you're not the mixing engineer, but you didn't need to say that. You just go, I will take care of this for you. Oh, you need album artwork. I will take care of this. Get on 99 designs, get on Fiverr, you know, get on Canva if it's you and help make that al that album. Or have a partner that you work with for that all the time. You know, being a sure. one-stop shop, it doesn't mean you have to do everything in house. You've got all these relationships. And exactly. then those people are going to send you people when people come to them and they're like, I need album art, but oh, by the way, do you know anyone that mixes or something like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, another thing that, um, that I'm, I'm, I'm sharing my process with um, inside my program is that I'm actually training people how to hire a virtual assistant, an affordable virtual assistant for them as a production company that can take some of this stuff off your plate. And also a lot of virtual assistants are the unicorns that they're great at admin. They're great with graphic design. Some of them even do video design and they, they even know how to build websites, right? So I actually teach people how to find those virtual assistants that can play that role in their company as well. Oh, that's amazing because that is just opens up a whole world of things you could add on to your services that right. I know musicians need because I hear them ask me questions about it. I get emails all the time. Do you know anyone that does X? Do you know anyone that, where can I get this? You know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. People definitely need that stuff. So it's great if you can offer it. Um, so let's talk about the other things that maybe aren't obvious to musicians. We've mentioned them a little bit along the way, but like the other kinds of services that you can offer that aren't necessarily music focused. I know we talked about, about podcast editing or maybe podcast music or audio books why don't, why don't you mention a few of people that you've worked with that you know that have gone into those areas? Um, I would say as far as like non-music, those would be the main things would be like audiobooks, podcast, podcast editing. But I've, I've, as far as listing off like the things that you can do from your home studio to make money, I just give you an example of, of a few of my revenue like streams, you know, you can make beats and you can lease beats. And this is not to like, discount like how, uh, or to, you know, to just, what is the word I'm trying to say? This is not to discount the, um, how hard it is to make a, or easy it is to make a hip hop beat, but I will say it's a lot less complicated than producing a rock or a pop track. There's mm -hmm. not as much intricacies to the mix. So if even at a basic level producer, you can be leasing your beats. That's what I'm getting at with that. So there's beat leases and check this out. This is a fun little fact. 
you know, you know, it takes about, what is it? 300 to 400,000 Spotify streams to make a thousand bucks, right? Mm -hmm. 300 to 500,000 streams to make a thousand dollars. I mean, isn't that crazy? That's a half a million streams to make a yes. thousand dollars. A lot of people on listening to your song. Yeah. Right. And, and, right. And, but if you are leasing your beats, which for me, it takes me about an hour or two to make a beat from top to, to, to bottom, right? I upload it to an online marketplace where I then lease it for $29.95. And people are like, oh, $29.95? That doesn't sound like a lot. Okay. But that is a non exclusive digital product that can make me money while I'm sleeping. So, how many of those does it take me to make a thousand dollars? Guess what? It takes 30. <laughs> mm. It takes 30 beat leases. So would you rather make a song that takes an hour or two and see that over time, like that you can make, a th- that just blows my mind. 30 beat leases will make you a thousand dollars. So, I mean, there's, wow. there's beat leasing, there's instrument. You can, uh, you can actually license original music. I work, I have some partners that I work with where they have a a licensing platform where you can go and upload your original songs, whether they're in demo form, that could be like an acoustic guitar and, um, and a vocal or whether they're fully produced and you can lease those songs to independent artists that don't know how to write music for themselves. Think about all these kids that are blowing up on YouTube and TikTok, but they don't write songs yet. They're doing covers. They need original music once they decide to pursue an artist career. And not everybody is in Nashville or LA or New York, where it's like, Oh, I know the publisher to get me the song. No, they go to websites like rocket songs, for example. So in order to work with somebody like that, where they're going to go and put your original music out there, you just got to be able to give them that demo. Once again, comes back to, can you record yourself? Here's something really cool about that too. I've had people license those songs at really low license fees from me when they didn't want the master. Cause maybe it was just a basic demo, but if the demo was really good, I've had people pay me as much as a thousand just to lease my master. That's not even giving away your song, by the way. You're just giving someone a license to use it. It's just like sync licensing. So now you're gonna get royalties when that artist release it. They are paying you to cover your song and they're paying you for the master. Yep, I've done that actually on my <laughs> holiday album. You know, I wanted to use a song that some, some of my friends wrote. And so I was gonna pay them royalties, of course. Um, but then I was like, hey, I really like the actual instrumental track for this. Can I just use it? It's going to save me a lot of money having to go create, recreate it myself. And they're like, sure, we already paid for it. So, you know, here's an amount you can pay us for it and save me money, save, gave them money, you know, and you don't yeah. think about those things. Yeah. Ooh, here's, a, here's another good one that if you're feeling like, oh, my production chops just aren't really there yet. Don't worry. Like I have actually gotten hired to do kids songs before where all they needed was an acoustic guitar, a nice warm vocal. They didn't want crazy processing. Just like, I'm talking like a little bit of reverb and they said, keep it really simple. And like, I played like a little marimba on my, uh, you know, or a little like vibraphone on my MIDI keyboard. So it's like, bing, bing, bing. You are my sunshine, my only (laughs) sunshine. I did that for an audio book and they ended up hiring me to do like 20 of these songs. Now each song only, I don't say only, but paid like 150 to 200, but It was a guitar vocal. It It didn't take me. It was so easy. It didn't take me more than an an hour or two to do each song. And there's a lot of work out there like that. So we can take the pressure off of like, okay, if I'm making a song for Disney, it needs to be at this level of, yeah, they've got the budget for that. And they are connecting with those people, but the market has expanded so much with the new, just new uh, technology industry, but the new music industry where you have content creators that are making things like TikTok videos and YouTubes, and they want to lease music as well. And they are not going to Adele. <laughs> they are not going to Imagine Dragons to license those songs because they are a new they can't influencer. afford that. No, I can't. Right. I mean, like, as a, I'll even say right now, I am a producer, but the, if you listen to my podcast on Produce Like a Boss, that intro, I didn't make that intro. I licensed that intro from another content creator, another producer, because it was just the perfect beat that I needed for my podcast intro. And I probably paid like 20 or 30 bucks for it. And I'll have to renew after a certain amount of time. And he probably has hundreds of other customers that pay him the same thing. That person's making bank on that one song. So it's all about getting out of the mindset of trading your time for money also, and thinking about how you can create digital products like that, where you're leasing beats or songs you already wrote. Talk about the hard drive graveyard. This is the hard drive revival (laughs) because now it's like things you thought, oh, that didn't make the thing I thought it could make. It's like, no, put it on this online platform and watch it make you money while you sleep. Oh, that's so cool. And and yeah, I'm glad you mentioned all of that because that's definitely a world I don't know about because I'm not currently, you know, making a lot of music. So that's really cool that there's these kind of 
you know, places you can go to put stuff up. I mean, I have some of my stuff up on, you know, audio sparks and places like that, that it's still making me money after 10 years or whatever, you know? So you never know what, what's going to happen with that kind of stuff and what's going to catch on. Um, I'm assuming, cause I remember when I was doing this kind of thing, like it all was referral. It was all like people telling people about me doing this or, you know, me getting hired to do a vocal and then, then them saying, oh, do you know anyone who mixes? And then me being like, oh, I could do it. How do people get started? Because I think that's the hardest thing is to start building this network where you start getting referrals and stuff. Are there ways nowadays where you can just go and like put yourself out there and actually find people cold? Yes, absolutely. Um, And just there's one little step before that that I want to go over, which is this portfolio. Okay. So Mm -hmm. part of building our company, like I was saying, you got to have systems in place and those email templates and all that. You also need to have a very solid portfolio ready to pitch because that's your job resume, right? So even if you're really good at what you do, but you don't have a solid representation of it, it's going to be really hard to get any client to, to pay you, right? So um, so you're going to want to make sure that you build a really amazing portfolio of at least three to five songs that demonstrate what it is you're trying to go out there and get work for. Basically, a demo reel, right? So if you're a great singer and you're looking for session work, don't put all this pressure that you have to write five amazing songs do a demo reel of five different covers. You're only trying to get hired for your vocals, not for your songwriting, then that's an appropriate demo reel. But if you're trying to get hired for songwriting, well then write five great songs. But the point is we got to go in there with a killer resume first. Um, And then what I do is I actually hit up the online marketplaces first because you can capitalize on other people's traffic, right? When you're first learning how to start a business, the last thing you need to know is like, become a Google and SEO expert. How do I get, you know, how do I build a website and then get traffic to it and then try to beat out websites that have millions. Let me write a million blog posts and hope one of those keywords gets ranked. And and it's not to say that we shouldn't be working on building our own businesses. You know, it's kind of the difference between like, if you get on Facebook or Instagram and make a post about something, you're going to reach a lot more people than if you just post it on your newsletter on your website, you're just going to jump on another traffic's, another website's traffic. So there are online marketplaces marketplaces like sound better and air gigs and beat stars, just to name a few, um, that you can go and upload your information, put in like, you know, the people will come to that platform looking for, I'm looking for a singer, I'm looking for a producer. And now you're going to pop up in the feed when they're searching based on what you put about yourself in your profile. So you still are going to maximize your keywords, right? You're going to want to say like what influences you sound like, you know, what your experience is, make sure you got a killer bio, good headshot, and then that demo reel of your songs. So your portfolio is displayed, then people can find you and hire you. Yes, you are going to pay a fee to that site. Yes. Yes, that site does control who gets to see. So, I mean, there's, there's cons and pros and, um, but you, it's traffic you otherwise wouldn't have had access to. So I'm willing to pay that fee and heck, if it really rubs you that wrong, then just build it into your fee. You can choose your price. If you normally charge 150 and, and, and you're like, Ooh, I can't take the hit on losing that fee charge 185, <laughs> you know? And then by the time the money comes to you after they've taken your fee, you're still getting what you need. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and I, I do the same thing, you know, I'm on air gigs and I love how, how they, you know, people find me on there and I did nothing, you know, they just show up in my inbox and I'm like, cool, I got a, got a demo gig. Awesome. Um, yeah. cause I'm not even promoting it at all, but like for those who are, and you can pay for that, you know, being bumped up in the categories and all that stuff, it's so worth it. And I want to shout out to, Um, actually I I interviewed someone who's going to be on the podcast in a few weeks, um, who founded Melody Nest and it's a similar kind of thing to air gigs and sound better and all that. And I hadn't heard of it before. And, um, it's, it's another place that you can can post Mm -hmm. as a producer as well. Ooh, Melody Nest. Melody Nest. Yes. Check it out. That's a new, that's a new one. I got to write that down. That's awesome. Ooh, you know what else I've discovered recently, which is popping up um, all over the place is custom songwriting businesses. I started Mm -hmm. seeing ads for this and I was like, wait, what, what is this? I checked it out. And there are Um, companies that are putting in the work to get the traffic, right? You could definitely do your own custom songwriting business, get your own ads going and try to do this. But once again, you can also hop on a moving train until you can launch your own business doing it and get with these companies like um, Tune River. I was going to say Tune River. I had them on the podcast a few months ago. Leo, right? Yes. He's awesome. Awesome. Um, And then there's Songfinch and there's, there's, there's a handful of them. And um, 
And you can be writing custom songs for people and getting paid. And you know what I love about Tune River is he's actually taking your current catalog because some of them are different, right? And he'll say, okay, let's take a song you already wrote. And then let's just, you know, as long as you have the ability to get in there and edit your own song, let's change a couple of these details so that we can customize it to the buyer and then, you know, get that and and then make that sale. And I love that because, you know, the the rate isn't super high, but if all you got to do is take a song that was making you no money on the hard drive graveyard and go in and replace a couple words, you know, to customize it for a person, then you get to make that money. It's totally worth it. Well, and if you write an evergreen style of song, like exactly. it, like I was saying, like a Valentine's Day, you know, love song, and then you yes. can just go in and put people's names in it or whatever, you know, details about how they met, you know, a few different, few lines are changed. It exactly. literally should take you no more than 30 minutes, right? Exactly. To go in there and change it and remix it and it's done. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, but that's all about systems. And I know you talk about, you know, having your, um, everything all organized on your, um, your DAW and all that stuff. So you can just jump in and easily do that. Cause I know you talk about, you know, having, uh, markers and things like that. So you could set it up with markers and go like, okay, this is the spot. Click, click, click. I'm done. (laughs) Yeah. I've even got it down to a science now where like, when I go to create, I I mean, talk about intention and and I go over this in in my program too, but it's like, I have this like a song info sheet. I have this metadata sheet, even if I'm not writing for sync, I'm still using um, these, these, uh, these sheets to organize my session so that when I go in there, I know exactly what I'm creating, who it's for, what the objective is. Um, You know, on these sheets, I'm going to have things like BPM, tempo, keywords, description, and everything. So that when I go to upload this anywhere, whether it's BeatStars or SoundBetter, you know, anywhere that would let me put up um, uh, songs that I'm trying to sell, that information is just there. If I'm uploading it to YouTube to do marketing, the information is just there. Mm. You know how many times I've opened a session when someone's like, what's the BPM on that session? Or what's the key? And I'm like, hold on, I got to open it. It's little things like that that slow you down where you realize, okay, I need systems for this. Like, where is there a spreadsheet where I can just have my entire catalog that if I open that spreadsheet, it will give me all the information I ever need to know. (laughs) Oh, and I will go out on a limb and say that I feel like most musicians don't don't do well in sync because they don't have this organization in place, Mm -hmm. right? They don't have their metadata set up. They don't have the spreadsheet like you were talking about where they've got all their (laughs) songs and they, you know, know that all, all the clearances are there and everything. And it's not like, oh, someone hears a song and they want to sync it. And they're like, oh, hold on. Let me go find this and that and the other thing. Right. And if I'm being honest, I think that's why the doors are getting sh- are shut even more tightly because music supervisors and libraries, they don't got time to play. You're making us look bad, people. Don't do yeah, that. We want them to love indie to- artists. Yeah, we want them to love indie artists. But the problem is, is we're just so excited. We don't understand that we're starting a business. So we handle ourselves like indie artists, right? And we reach out, hey, oh my God, I got all this music. And we got a template. We blast it out to 30 different supervisors and hope for the best. That, that doesn't work, right? And I, I will say right now, and I used to be the person who was like, like, man, I'd hear something and I go, I'm better than that person. Why did that person get that song synced, right? Like that was me like years and years ago <laughs> in, a, in a scarcity and a much different mindset. And I realized that, oh my gosh, it isn't just talent. Like my talent is never going to be enough. And I was so busy in the woodshed just trying to get better. Oh, if I'm really good at this, then my, my, the talent, the art will speak for itself. It doesn't. <laughs> Stop doing that. You have to be as good at business, if not better than your music, because there are people that are less talented than you that when they get these systems in place, will just run circles around you. Because in the end of the day, a supervisor would rather take something that they know is one stop that is cleared that they can place right away because this person has their ish together than the person person that's like has an amazing song but like oh I don't know do I have a PRO what's metadata not gonna work you know (laughs) and I find that to be so encouraging because you know your talent is what it is like you can make it better you can practice you can do all that but like for me vocal talent right I have a great voice but I'm not any Demi Lovato you know I'm never gonna be her but I know that I can surpass by being a great business person, being someone who's easy to work with, being professional, all of that, that's going to trump, you know, the fact that my talent is mediocre (laughs) many times. I just had to speak to that because it it reminds me of, I've actually composed a theme song for a major organization for several years in a row. And the first time that they came to me, and it was through one of these online marketplaces, they had posted like a job on a job board and I bid on it as did many other producers. I'm talking producers with Grammy 
awards and far more credits than I have. And that's another thing I get from other people that they get on the sound better and stuff. They're like, dude, there's all these people that have worked with Rihanna and Beyonce. I'm like, don't worry because it's all about the service you provide. Mm. So anyways, this person, they're looking to hire someone to do a theme song for that's a little, you know, it's not musical in any way. It's about a business, right? So we're talking about like farming and farmers and stuff like that. But I just get in there and I look at the brief and like what they need. And I'm like, I know exactly what to do. I communicate that effectively. I check in along the way. I'm like, Hey, here's what I'm thinking. And you know, just my whole process that I have that I teach. And they, they said, you know, I got to tell you at the end, they said, we've hired a different producer every year for this because no one ever really quite gets it there. They seem more concerned with trying to show off what they want to do or what their talent is as a producer and they don't actually listen to what we ask them to do which is include these keywords match this reference track and give us this vibe so it can fit what our you know they put it to a great video that they edit and they said you were the only one that actually listened to the needs of what our company wanted thank you we will keep coming back to you mm. i will tell you right now my talent did not get me that gig i'm not the best producer in the world i'm i'm, I'm a good i'm a great producer I'm a, I'm a great singer i'm not the best at any of these things though it's the talent stacking that i was telling you about earlier that I think that does it. People are like, wow, this girl, really, she's professional. She's a great attitude. Her music is good, but, and she knows what she's doing. <laughs> it's the combination of all those things that makes it a win for the client, not the talent. Absolutely. I so, so agree. Oh my gosh. We've talked about so much great stuff. Is there anything we haven't covered here that you think musicians need to know that are looking to try to expand into this area of income? Yeah, I would just say that, um, you know, I say that there's, there's a difference between the, what I think is the starving artist is and the boss producer. Right. And I think that the starving are, well, you know, a lot of people are trying to get out of this. Like, why do I, why am I such a starving artist? And for me, cause I was there, I was there where I didn't understand. I kept saying, why won't people pay me for my music? And I wasn't getting answers. And it wasn't until the quality of my question changed that I got the answer. So I stopped asking that question and I started asking what kind of music can I make? What can I do to make music with my money? And then it was like, boom, boom, right? So the starving artist is a little bit more self-focused. You know, why, why doesn't people just want to pay me for what I do? That's like showing up to someone's house with a house full of vegans. You cooked a steak dinner and you're wondering why no one wants to eat it. You never asked what they wanted. And so it's like, know your audience, right? So the boss producer is more service focused. And I think the starving artist is a little more self-focused. So if we can just get out of our heads and frame our questions better, and say, what can I do to turn this into a job? I think the answers will come. And I think it, it involves dealing with your ego a little bit because I know many artists will say, well, I don't want to sell out. Right. Sure. Right. Sure. And so you have to get past that. Like, do you want to make money <laughs> or then, then, then stop saying you want to make money with your music because right. you can't have both. You can't be anti-commercialism and then want the paycheck that comes with creating commercial music it's just not, it's not possible, you know? So it's like, you know, a lot of people will, they'll scoff and they'll be like, Oh, art is so precious. And oh, I just want to do this and this and this. And that's the same person. Then it's like, you know, why won't anyone pay me for my art? <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, look, look at it. <laughs> and I also look at it. And if you're making good money, like you mentioned at the beginning, if you're making, if you're getting that $100,000 a year that you want, then you will have that money to go out and make your artistic project that, you know, is not commercial and makes you feel like you're not selling out, but you're not hinging your entire livelihood on that. hundred percent. Okay. Here's a good example. John Mayer, he is a blues guitarist. If you see mm -hmm. what he's doing now and what he's done for the last several years, once the label let, you know, cut the reins loose and let him do what he wants, it's very clear that he is like a, oh, I want to, I'm a Jimi Hendrix. You know, that's his style. He is a shredder. He's a blues lover. He's got the John Mayer trio. Which, There's wow, no, you would never know that, right? You would never know that, right? But the labels were smarter business people than that. They, you know, they looked at a market and went, blues is not the market that's going to break you. We need to reach the masses. And unfortunately, while I love blues, Blues, blues is not mainstream. It is not pop. So they said, you're going to come out with your body as a wonderland and make every teenage girl and their mom <laughs> and their grandma fall in love with you first. Okay. And you'll notice this is a pattern with every artist, Christina Aguilera, Britney Spears, Demi Lovato. They all come out very vanilla because they're commercializing. They're going, Hey, we want to be something that can be kind of, they're trying to reach the masses, right? Then 
as they grow, it's like all of a sudden Britney Spears is doing slave and you're like, whoa, <laughs> all of a sudden you see them morph into the artist that they, and they're now their message, what they really wanted to do. It comes with the freedom they have by reaching the top first, right? So there is something to be said about, you know, playing the game with one foot in and one foot out. And you're absolutely right. Once you're making the money you want, make the, the dream artistic project that you want, but just I'm kind of railing one more thing here to, to, to that, because I used to be that person that was like, oh, like I only like, I, I just want to do the art. I do a lot of commercial music. There's not one piece of music that I make for money that I don't love. It it's is, not like you're it, making crap. I'm not making crap music. I'm making really good music, num- you know, number one, but number two, you cannot help but put yourself into your songs. So I, if, even if I tried to go and do a remake of a, like a pop song, someone does that, they go, give me this it still has a little Chris Bradley in there. You know, my thing is this kind of like, almost like a rock meets jazzy bluesy thing in my vocal. And like, that's not for everybody, but it it shines through in what I do to where like, I'll make a pop track, but it's got that thing that makes it a little bit different. And so don't be afraid to like, keep a little bit of like, I call it one foot inside the box, one foot out, you know? Yep. Yeah. I think, I think it's what creates originality because I'm a big fan of using reference tracks, but I think the trick, and by the way, for those who don't know what that means, it just means you're using the math of another song to create one song. doesn't mean we're going to copycat it. That's a sound alike, totally different, but a reference track is when you go, okay, what instrumentation did they use? Okay. How long before they got to the verse? And then what did they do in the course? Okay. They added guitars and synths and they go, I'm going to try and make a track like that using that math. Right. Well, you can get really dangerously close to sounding like that song if you don't tweak a few things, right? So you tweak things, you imitate, then you innovate, but then also you insert yourself at kind of the last minute and all of a sudden the song sounds nothing like that reference because nobody is you. That's right. And I found that so interesting when I saw you demonstrate that because I thought at first, oh my gosh, this is going to come out sounding almost like this with different lyrics and a little bit different melody, but it didn't sound anything like it. Yeah. Um, but I love the idea of the math because for me, like I'm not an, like inherently an arranger that I don't really have a talent in that area, but I think I do have a talent in making the vocals sound unique to me and the melody. And so I think I could, I could definitely employ that and, and make it sound unique, but it's, it's just interesting because when you did that, I thought, I thought it was going to sound cookie cutter and it didn't at all. <laughs> There's, yeah. I mean, there's, there's a couple different ways to do it. I've definitely had clients where they're like, I need this song to sound like this song, but not sound like this song. And it's kind of like, almost like they could share a playlist in which case I can doctor up how I do a reference track and get it a little bit closer so that I'm giving my client what they want. But oftentimes I'm a fan of using the math only because it really is indistinguishable. And number two, it helps to break you out of blank page syndrome. A lot of like what stops mm-hmm. us from getting in and producing or, or moving forward as we get stuck. So having that math there is just like a gentle roadmap that almost just keeps it's like, oh, what do I do for this course? Wait, what did they do? Oh yeah, of course. I should just add a tambourine and another synth, <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. I love that. I love that. Well, gosh, this has been such a great conversation and I love getting into the more entrepreneurial side of what you do and how you help artists. Um, let artists know how they can find out more about you and definitely you guys check out the previous episode that I did with her on this podcast. It's, I don't know, several episodes back. It's about a year ago, but, um, it's, she covers even more of like the basics about production and stuff, but I loved having this more advanced conversation on the entrepreneurial side. Yeah, you, me too. I always love chatting with you. Thanks for having me. Um, and yeah, we, we do have a five day challenge coming up in September. I know that we're going to, Brie is going to drop the link for it in the show notes. Um, and it is called the boss producer bootcamp. And in this bootcamp, it's a five day free bootcamp where I'm going to teach you the mindset that it takes to go full time as a music producer, what it takes to run a business from your home studio. And I actually, we've touched on it a little bit today, but I really outlined the path from amateur musician, which just means unpaid all the way into what a pro musician is. And I fill in those steps for you so that you have a clear cut path on how to go from amateur to pro. Um, I'm going to show you how to increase the quality of your productions. If you're producing, but you're like, gosh, it's just not there yet. And how to make pitchable, placeable and profitable music. And then I'm going to show you how to make money online, whether you're a producer, a mix engineer, or a session singer, or an instrumentalist, or beat maker, the list goes on. So it's a five day free challenge. And I just got to say one thing here. I know there's a lot of free crap out there. Okay. And I don't want you to treat this like a freebie throwaway because it's not, I want you to treat it like it costs thousands of dollars because I have people that have been through my trainings that are like, I went to Berkeley and I didn't learn this stuff. Mm. So 
I want you to know how valuable it is and treat it like that. And I want you to attend. Brie will drop the link for you in the show notes. I absolutely will. And I, I've heard from your student, my students and now your students that these challenges are epic and very, very motivate, motivating. So love yeah. for all of you to, to participate. And I will definitely drop the link. Thank you so much, Chris. This has been great. Thank you. It's been a blast. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician. 